Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Come on, praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord, Mueller. Come on, we can do better than that. Praise the Lord, saints. Oh, come on, come on. I know you got a praise on your lips. Can we just take a moment just to give God the, all the glory, all the honor, all the praise? The scripture says enter. That means come into the sanctuary with a praise on your lips. We bless the name for another opportunity to come before you in our faith forward spring revival. We pray that you will lend your voices and lend your prayers as we uplift the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's go. Good evening, Beulah. Good evening. Let's give the Lord another hand clap of praise. <laughs> we don't ask you to stand for the reading of the word. Amen. Our scripture this afternoon will be coming from Romans, the 10th chapter, the 11th through the 15th verse. Amen. For the scriptures say, whosoever believe on him shall not be ashamed. Yes. For there is no difference between the Jews and the Greek. Yes. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Yes. And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Yes. And how shall they preach except they be sent? Yes, sir. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings to good things. This is God's word for God's people. Amen. Good evening, Beulah. Good evening. Well, it's like the crowd is small, but we're going to sing Pass me not, O gentle Savior, and I want everybody, everybody help me sing this song, <laughs> okay? Because we're about to have church tonight, right? Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, O Lord, in
Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we come thanking you, Lord, for this day, thanking you for life, health, and strength. And Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we come tonight just thanking you for all your blessing that thou hast bestowed upon us. And now, Lord, I pray that you will continue to bless me and my family, my wife, my children, my grandchildren. And then, Lord, we pray for our pastor, Pastor Black, and First Lady, Sister Kate. And then, Lord, we pray for each and every one that's in your midst tonight. And, Lord, we pray for this revival, and we pray for our revivalists. We pray, Lord, that you will anoint him on fresh tonight and give us a, a word from you. Lord, we just thank you because you've been so good to us. And we just thank, Lord, where would we be if it wasn't for you? And we just thank you, Lord, for for this prayer. And we pray now that you will continue to bless us and keep us. And we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Is there anybody here who knows anything about not just putting some things in his hand, but putting all things in his hand? If you do, don't just look at me if you put it in his hand. Let's give him some praise in this house this evening. Oh, Deacon Owens, I put it all in his hand. And I learned that when I give it to him, leave it there. Oh, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Oh, we give glory, honor, and praise our Heavenly Father on this second evening of our spring revival. And we are so grateful and thankful to God that he has made it possible for each of us to be able to be on board in this second evening. We certainly want to say welcome to all of our members and friends who are joining us here in the sanctuary on this second evening of revival but also to all of our members and friends who are joining us online as this service is going out stream live from this sanctuary on this evening amen all across metro atlanta all across the state of georgia all across the United States of America, and guess what, even to foreign shores. Amen. If there was ever a time when our world needs revival, that time is now. And we're just grateful and thankful to God. Thank you to our beloved deacons. Amen. For the powerful devotion. Amen. Greetings to all of the preachers of the gospel who grace us with your presence on this evening. Amen. Certainly our guest evangelist, Reverend Dr. Maurice Watson. Amen. <laughs> to all of our mothers who are on board with us this evening. Amen. God bless you. Our deaconess, our minister's spouses, to all of our ushers and nurses, to every member of our Beulah family and to every friend, we greet you on this second evening of revival in that name that is above every other name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Somebody wanted to be here this evening, communicated with me, but their condition, physically, health-wise, would not allow them to be with us. Amen. And they yearn for the opportunity to be in the sanctuary. Amen. In the gathering of the saints. And we certainly keep them lifted in our prayers. Brothers and sisters, I want us to know that this second evening of revival follows what was last night. And who among us who was here last night can forget about how the Lord moved in this place on last night. Amen. And we're so grateful to God. Amen. Uh, for our preacher this evening. Amen. Who is back with us for this second evening. We are just happy to mention the fact that visiting friends are always, always welcomed and embraced with open arms and spirits of welcome whenever you come to Beulah. And we just want to pause for a brief moment, amen, and just ask that every visiting friend would please stand. And Beulah, if you're near a visitor who's standing, Amen. Would you make, make it an effort to shake their hand and just greet them and let them know, amen, in that Bulleristic style, that we are happy to have them in the number. Amen. 
Glad to be in the service. One more time. God bless you. God bless you. Brothers and sisters, our revival is proving already to be a blessing to so many. And certainly we want to be a blessing to the man of God who has been such a blessing to us. But very quickly, amen, I would that everybody would stand. Does anybody remember that song? What a fellowship. What a joy divine. When you're leaning on the everlasting arm. Amen. If you know it, will you help us to sing it? And will you just fellowship with somebody around you? What? That's it. but I'm going to keep on leaning on the master's everlasting arm because I'm benefited by it. He keeps me safe and secure from all of life's alarms. 
Well, again, we have gathered in this house, gathered in his name to worship him. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And on this second evening of our spring revival, amen. Amen. Our faith is so crucial in our breakthroughs and in the miracles that God will perform in our lives. Just believe it. Lord, I know you can handle it. I know you can do it. Amen. Amen. And this revival, amen, we have as our basic, our basic scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. And as we go further into this time of spring revival, we again share the same thing that we shared on last night, and that is that this is the first revival service since we have had since the pandemic amen and we are just thankful of god to be able to return again for this special and sacred purpose because every now and then the strongest of us need rejuvenating the strongest of us need amen re-encouraging we need to be Amen. Strengthen afresh and anew. And we are so grateful to God that that is what this spring revival is all about. Amen. We again want to say thank you to all of our preachers who have gathered all of these wonderful visiting ministers and pastors. Amen. Who join us on this evening. Amen. Numbered among them is one of our sons in the ministry. Uh, the Reverend Fred Young. Amen. Stand up, Reverend Young. Amen. Many of us know him from his work and his service here at Beulah. Amen. And the times when he sang with the choirs, and, and then the time that God called him into the preaching ministry. And now he is the pastor of the Great Bethel Baptist Church in Alexandria, Alabama. And we're so happy, Fred, to have you back home with us on this evening. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. But all of our guest preachers and pastors, would you please stand? We just want you to know how happy we are. Amen. To have you. Your presence is an added enhancement to this second evening of revival. Amen. Our preacher has already been a powerful blessing to us, and uh, we wait anxiously with tremendous anticipation uh, with what God has to share with us through him on this evening. But we want to move now and just ask that we would prepare to come with our offering. Amen. Our offering. In this offertory period, we want to be a blessing to the man of God who is pouring out his heart. Amen. And his spirit uh, with us in this time of revival. We can't possibly repay him for the word. Amen. But we can express our appreciation. Amen to him for his wonderful, a wonderful preaching and for the fact that his preaching has impacted our lives in such a powerful way. I think we all left here last night knowing, amen, that sometimes we have to lose in order to win. Amen, amen, amen. Gave us a new perspective on losing, amen. And we have wonderful blessings in store awaiting us shortly on this evening. Delicious food was prepared Amen. downstairs. And some of you have gone down like Reverend Seal shared with me. Amen. And overdid it. Amen. Came back up grunting and amen. Trying to balance himself. Amen. Uh, but you know how they can do it downstairs. 
Amen. And dinner is prepared each evening. Amen. And starting at 6 p.m. all the way up till, amen, the 7 o'clock hour where we start our kickoff of revival service. And we certainly want you to know you can go down and enjoy a delicious dinner, amen, prior to coming up here to enjoy that spiritual food that God has for us. Brothers and sisters, as we get ready to go now into this time of offering, let us go to our Heavenly Father in a brief moment of prayer. Wonderful God, our blessed Heavenly Father, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Dear Father, we reverence you. We praise you. We thank you for every blessing that you have rained down upon us. The greatest blessing of all being your son, your darling son, and our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, dear Father, as we prepare to come with our offerings, we pray your blessings upon all of your people. Dear Father, that we will come generously giving, knowing, dear Father, uh, that you will continue to shower your blessings down upon us. Some may not be able to give as much as others, but give the best that you can give. And Father, we ask your blessings upon them. For we ask it all now in Jesus' holy name, and we say thank you, and amen, 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 and amen. God bless you. Beloved, will we all stand wherever you are in the sanctuary? Amen. And I believe ushers are in the balcony to serve those. Amen. So if you're in the balcony, would you please stand anyway so that they will be able to, amen, make their way to you. Amen. Will those in the balcony please stand at this time also? Amen. Will those in the balcony please stand? God bless you. Amen. Jesus. 
Great Father, once more we say thank you. Thank you, dear Father, for these your people who have given. Dear Father, we pray and ask your blessings upon each of them. We pray, dear Father, that you will supply every need. That you, dear Father, will open doors that need to be opened. You, that you will make ways that need so greatly to be made. We pray now in Jesus' name. And we say thank you, thank you and amen, 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 amen. 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 God bless you, God bless you. Well, my brothers and sisters, it's preaching time. Amen. amen. It's preaching time. And I was always told, don't play on the tracks when a train is coming through. Amen. And we certainly don't want to, uh, by any means, amen, delay the preaching of the word. We just want to make mention of the fact that the preacher is by no means a stranger to us here at Beulah. He has distinguished himself here at Beulah on a number of occasions in revival. Amen. And on other occasions, and always we were blessed by the timely word that God gave him for us. And we could all leave enriched by that word. He is my dear longtime friend of many, many years, the Reverend Dr. Maurice Watson, who is now back home in uh, our native home state of Arkansas. Amen. He has crisscrossed this nation <laughs> preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And he has shared, amen, with so many across this nation. And he is recognized as one of the great preaching voices of our time. We are very privileged to have him sharing with us. Amen. Uh, Friendship goes back to the days of our youth when we were both young bucks in the ministry. Amen. And amen. Uh, I was sharing with him that neither of us can claim that young buck status anymore. So if you're in that young buck status, enjoy it. Because it won't last always. Amen, amen, amen. Our preacher is here uh, from the great Second Baptist Church of Little Rock, Arkansas. Amen. Where he is currently uh, the pastor and doing a tremendous job at the Second Baptist Church of Little Rock. And we are looking forward to a word of God from him on this evening. Just before he comes, the choir will come with another selection, after which the next voice that we will hear will be that of our preacher. Amen. Amen. Our evangelist, our revivalist, the Reverend Dr. Maurice Watson. I'm asking that we will all pray with him and pray for him because prayer and preaching goes together. Amen. After this next selection from the choir, amen. The next voice that we will hear will be that of my longtime beloved friend and brother, amen. Reverend Dr. Maurice Watson.
Let us pray. Father, how we love and thank you for the privilege that is ours to once again assemble ourselves together to worship you in a collective and corporate way. We thank you, Lord, for this privilege. And it is a privilege just to be able to call on your name. We confess our sins before you. <clears throat> we pray you'd forgive us and cleanse us even now from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, for how you continue to look beyond our faults and see our needs. And we are not ashamed to publicly declare tonight how much we need you and we can't get along without you. Now, God, as I stand to proclaim your word, I pray for a fresh anointing, a fresh enablement, a fresh empowerment of your Holy Spirit. Use me now in such a way that everything I, I do and say will only be done and only be said so that you might receive the glory. God, have your way tonight in us, through us and among us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, this indeed is the day the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Certainly, I take this moment to recognize the very fine pastor of this church, Pastor Dr. Jerry Black. Amen. <laughs> to all of the pastors and ministers who are present tonight, both in the pulpit and in the audience, to each of you, the wonderful members of the Beulah Church, and certainly to First Lady, we always want to recognize First Lady Kate. <clears throat> And to each of us, brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor and a privilege to once again uh, have been invited by your pastor to come and share with you from uh, the Word of God. There is a word I'd like to share with you. We want to draw, if you will, from an old well and see if we can get something fresh from it. Psalm 23. You ought to know this by heart. I just want to look at the back half of Psalm 23. Verses 4 through 6. Psalm 23, verses 4 through 6. I'm reading from the New King James Bible. If you found this passage, can you indicate as such by saying amen? amen. Hear the words of David. When he said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely... Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I want to talk tonight about getting through your valley. getting through your valley. Friends, within the scheme, if you will, of certain geographic areas of the earth's terrain, there are elongated depressions of the earth's surface, usually between ranges of mountains. These elongated, if you will, depressions are called valleys. Wherever there are two or more mountains that are close together, there will inevitably be sandwiched between them a valley. When one considers this geographical fact, one also understands that the same principle holds true in life. It seems, my brothers and sisters, that wherever there are mountains in our lives, there will subsequently and periodically be some valleys. The terrain of life is not flat and unchanging, but it's a series of mountains and valleys. Life is not always a mountaintop experience of happiness and bliss, but it is sometimes a valley experience of trial, trouble, difficulty, and hardship. 
David, my brothers and sisters, gives credence to this fact in the 23rd Psalm with picturesque profundity and allegorical accuracy. David, my friends, permits us to tag along with him as he followed behind the Lord who was his shepherd. In the first three verses of this psalm, he carries with us on a journey, if you will, to some of the mountaintop experiences in his life. He told us, friends, that on the mountaintop with his shepherd, there was no need for him to worry about those things that he needed uh, in order to survive because the Lord had supplied him with all that he needs. And moreover, friends, on the mountaintop with the shepherd, he was led into places where of prosperity, peace, and tranquility. These, friends, are places where the pastures were green and the waters were still. But as David continues now to look back through the rearview mirror of his life and his many experiences, he, he makes an, a very important announcement to all of us. And that announcement is that in this life, life not only allows us to experience the glitter of the mountain, but life also allows us to face those times when we have to face, if you will, the gloom of the valley. However, even while in the midst of a valley situation, David has us to know that with the Lord as our shepherd, we can have victory in our valleys. I thought I'd preach this tonight because somebody that came to church tonight looking good and smelling good and all dressed up, but the reality is that if you live long enough, you're going to face some valleys. I don't care who you are, I don't care what side of town you grew up on. If you live long enough in this life, you're going to face some valleys. But David shares, I believe, some important truths that can help us to know how to get through our valleys. And so I want to share them with you tonight. Let, let me just share these little movements. I'll make some comments and I'll soon be in my seat. I think David is teaching in the first place that if you're going to get through your valley, you need to acknowledge the reality of the valley. Yeah, acknowledge the reality of the valley. Yay! Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. No, notice, notice, friends, how in the first three verses of the passage, David spoke to, about God in third person. He, he, if you will, he uh, makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the sealed waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But as he goes into the second half of the psalm, he, he moves from third person to second person, you. Do I have a witness here? Because when he's on the mountain, he talks about God. But when he gets in the valley, he's talking to God. Do I have a witness in here? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Some say that the valley of the shadow of death refers, if you will, to the darkness of death. Um, others say it refers to a dark ravine or a dangerous place. But I believe that the valley of the shadow of death is, is any difficult experience that makes us afraid, including death. What, what a definite difference in David's dialogue. Now, earlier he spoke of plentiful pastures and green pastures and still waters and righteous paths. But now he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. In other words, yes, this valley is real. Yes, this valley is not a mirage. What, I, what, what David is trying to get us to see is that we will not only have some mountains in life, you're going to have to go through some valleys. If you would live long enough, friends, you're going to sometimes be in the valley. The valley is something you can't escape. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how educated you are. It doesn't matter where you went to school. It doesn't matter how connected you are downtown. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter on which side of the track you were born. If you live long enough, you're going to face some valleys in life. Do I have a witness here? You're going to face what my friend Don Parson uh, uh, appropriately called valley times. Can church say valley times? Valley times when life is caving in on you. Valley
valley times when problems and pain invade your premises valley times when joy has lost your address and peace has forgotten your phone number and your and and, and your happiness has run out of gas valley times when you look up for sunlight but there is no sunlight in view because your sunlight has been eclipsed by your mountains of despair every one of us go have some valley times we're going to go through some valley time. Financial crisis, that's a valley. Problem in the home, that's a valley. Children stay in trouble, that's a valley. Your parents don't understand you, that's a valley. Lose a loved one, that's a valley. Sickness is in your body, that's a valley. You can't find a job, that's a valley. You're lonely and depressed. Every one of us going to face some valley times in life. But if you're going to be victorious over your valley, you got to acknowledge that your valley is real. You know, I know that there are those who misquote that scripture that says life and death are in the power of the tongue. So if you are going through something, you should never admit it. If you're sick, you shouldn't say I'm sick. You should say I'm healed. You should never admit your real situation. But can I teach you something tonight? Authentic faith is not living in denial. Authentic faith says, yes, this sickness is real. Yes, this cancer is real. Yes, these marital problems are real. Yes, my situation is dark. But if I've got God and another breath to breathe, I've got a fighting chance to survive it. You got to acknowledge that the valley is real. But you can get through it. It depends first on your progression. Let's just say progression. Yea, though I walk. David is not paralyzed with fear and trepidation as he's in the valley, no. But while he's in the valley, he's determined to come out victorious on the other side. He said, yea, though I walk. Walking means you're making progress. Walking means you're not standing still. Walking means that you're moving forward. The worst thing you can ever do when you're in the valley is to stop walking by faith. If you're in your valley tonight, friends, the worst thing you can do is start feeling sorry for yourself and having your pity party and inviting everybody to come to your pity party. You'll become a victim of your valley instead of a victor over your valley. Whatever you do, he's saying, keep walking. Let's just say, keep walking. There is Mary and Martha. That first Easter morning, they are on their way to the tomb of Jesus to anoint Jesus' body with spices. But on their way to the tomb, they were wondering who's going to roll away that great big old stone that's in the entry of the sepulcher. They knew that that stone was too big and too large and too heavy for them to move. So as they were walking, they were wondering who's going to roll the stone away. But here's the good news. While they wondered, they kept walking. And can I talk to somebody tonight? You came in here wondering how your body's going to be healed while you wonder, keep walking. Wondering if your marriage can be saved while you wonder, keep walking. Wondering if that wayward child of yours can be turned around while you wonder, keep walking. Because if you keep walking, you might discover what the sisters discovered that morning. When they got to the tomb, an angel had already rolled a stone away. That while they were trying to figure it out, God had already worked it out. Keep walking. Keep, keep. Depends on your progression. I'm in this valley, but I'm going to keep walking. But you can get through it. Not only does it depend, depend on your progression, it depends on your perception. Let's just say your perception. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> David says the reason I'm going to be victorious in my valley is because I've got the right perception of what's happening to me. In other words, it all depends on how you see things. He admits that the valley is dark. He admits that it's dangerous in the valley. He admits that it's fraught with the possibility for death and destruction. But when he looked at what he was going through, he said, although these, these, these 
circumstances are real, I, I look at how they can affect me, not as something that's going to take me out. I look at them as nothing but shadows. Shadows look dangerous. Shadows look intimidating. Shadows, brothers and sisters, look like they can, they can wipe you out, but I want to tell you today, the shadow can't harm you. The shadow of a snake can't bite you. The shadow of a lion can't attack you. But if you don't see things right, the shadow of a snake and the shadow of a lion can chase you away. When, when I was a little boy growing up over in North Little Rock, I remember, I remember uh, around 2.30 every day, there was this show that used to come on. It used to scare me to death. I couldn't stand it. It was called Dark Shadows. <laughs> oh, Dark Shadows. Oh, Barnabas. Y'all remember Barnabas the vampire? He'd go around biting folk and it, it would scare me. I would have nightmares. Couldn't sleep. So while my friends were in the back room watching Dark Shadows, I went to the front room because I said all I got to do is wait till 3 o'clock because at 3 o'clock Bozo's coming on. I got, I got to catch some Bozo because I couldn't stand Dark Shadows. Am I talking to somebody tonight? When you look at your life, Looks like you're facing some dark shadows. Bills are piling up, financial crisis on every hand, problems everywhere you turn. And sometimes those dark shadows can chase you away if you're not careful. But while your problems and your troubles are real, your response to them must not be that of fear and panic, but you got to look at them as nothing but shadows. Because it's not what happens to you, but how you perceive what's happening to you that helps you to have the right response. Because sometimes what seems like the end of the road is not really the end of the road, it's just a bend in the road. Oh, but there it is. He says, if you're going to get through your valley, stop living in denial. Uh, you got to acknowledge the reality of the valley. But wait, if you're going to get through your valley, you got to uh, announce your response in the valley. He says that while you are in this valley, you, 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 it's how you respond that, that, ma that makes a difference as to how you're going to come out. You've got to declare some things while you're still in the valley. First of all, you got to declare your faith. He says, yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? I will fear no evil. He says, I'm in the valley, but the valley is not in me. I will not be afraid because I'm going to face my valley with faith. When we're in the valley, it's so easy to become afraid. But the only thing that can cancel out your fear is your faith. Because fear and faith are like light and darkness. They don't occupy the same space at the same time. That's why when you walk into a room and the room is dark and you flip the light switch on, darkness has to leave so light can come in because they don't occupy the same space at the same time. So it is with fear and faith. Friends, I want to tell you today that the only thing that can cancel out your faith is your fear. And the only thing that can cancel out your fear is your faith. There is Peter. There he is. There he is out there in that boat in the storm. Jesus is walking on the water. Lord, if it's you, let me come out. Bid me to come out. Come on, Peter. Peter got out the boat and started walking on the water, going to Jesus. Yes, we know he looked around and he saw the wind was boisterous and the waves were, 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 were all over the place. And yes, he began to sink. It wasn't because of that. The Bible tells us why he started sinking. The Bible says, and he became afraid. He began to sink. But do you know what gets me about that passage is not so much that he began to sink, but what intrigues me is his proximity to Jesus when he was sinking. He was in, within arm's reach of Jesus sinking. How you know he's with arm's reach? Because when he said, Lord, save me, the Lord just reached out his hand and lifted him up. How can you be that close to Jesus sinking? Somebody in here right now, you go to church every Sunday sinking. You go to Sunday school every week sinking. You go to Bible study sinking. You go to every workshop, every conference that comes to town and you're sinking. You listen to some of the best preaching every weekend from Pastor Black and yet you are sinking. Sinking. 
sinking. Because your fears have taken over. You got to declare your faith. But while you're in this thing, you got to declare your fellowship. You know why I won't fear, he says? For you are with me. David says, the reason I'm not going to be afraid is because while I'm in the valley, I know I'm not in the valley by myself. Because when you have fellowship with the shepherd and when you have communion with God, the shepherd, you know that even if he leads you into a valley, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. When, when my girls, when, when my younger daughter was a little girl about three years old, um, she came into our room one night. I said, what's the matter? She said, I'm scared. I said, why are you scared? She said, because it's dark in my room. Can I get in the bed with you all? Jumped in the bed with us. Went fast asleep. Now, as I looked at that pastor, uh, same darkness that was in our room <laughs> was in her room. She got up in a dark room, walked down a dark hall, and came into our dark room and got in the bed and went to sleep. The reason she could go to sleep is because she knew that in the darkness, she was not by herself. Her parents were with her. Mm. That's all I can tell you sometimes. That's all that you can lean on sometimes. I know God is with me. I know this cancer is still in my body, but God is with me. I know these children are still acting the fool, but God is with me. I know my bills are piling up on every hand, but God has not left me. He is with me. You got to declare, you got to declare your, your faith. You got to declare, next of all, you got to declare your fellowship. He says, you are with me. But then you need to declare your final outcome. Watch what he says. Yea, though I walk through the valley. David was still in the valley when he made this declaration. He said, but while I'm still in the valley, I'm not gonna wait till I come out the valley to declare my victory. I'm gonna declare my final outcome while I'm still in the valley. I'm declaring, David says, that I'm coming out of this. He said, yea, though I walk through the valley. He didn't say, yea, though I walk in the valley. He didn't say, yea, do I sit in the valley. Yea, though I stay in the valley. But yea, though I walk through the valley, which means if you keep picking them up and putting them down, sooner or later, you're going to come out on the other side. Your valley may be dark, it may be difficult, but I've come to tell you tonight that with God's help, you can get through it. You got to declare your final outcome while you're still in the valley. You got to tell yourself by faith, I'm going to get through this. If it's a dark valley, I'm going to get through this. If it's a heavy burden, I'm going to get through this. If it's a tough time, I'm going to get through this. If it's a financial crisis, I'm going to get through this. If it is a domestic problem, I'm going to get through this. If it's a lonely night, I'm going to get through this. If I can't find a job, I'm going to get through this. If I need a friend, I'm going to get through this if I need a door opened I'm going to get through this if I need a miracle tonight I'm going I'm going to get through this this is a faith revival ain't it I'm going I'm not gonna wait till it happens I'm gonna start thanking God now I'm gonna thank I'm gonna begin to thank God as if it's as, as if I already got it every now and then you got to tell God Lord I'm gonna I'm gonna praise you on credit because your credit is good with me. Do I have a witness in here? There's one more thing and I'm in my seat for the night. Here's a lesson. You're going to get through your valley. Last thing you need to accept your resources in the valley. Yeah. And while you're in this valley, God, the good shepherd, has given us some resources that will help you to get through it. Do I have a witness? What resources does God give us? I'm glad you asked. First of all, he gives us God's protection. Let church say God's protection. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. That a rod was a club-like stick, if you will, uh, that the shepherd used to fight off the predators that came to attack the sheep, the coyotes and the wolves. He would fight them off because you see, sheep are helpless. They couldn't, they can't defend themselves. They have to depend on the shepherd to protect them. Are you with me here? And the good shepherd would lay down his life for his sheep. 
David, who was a, a, a shepherd himself, knew from first hand because one day while keeping watch over his father's sheep, a lion and a bear attacked them and David killed them both with his bare hands. No pun intended because the good shepherd will always provide protection for his sheep. President Obama uh, perhaps was the president who received more death threats than any president in U.S. history. Somebody asked him on one occasion, do you feel safe? He says, yes, I do. Why? Because I've got excellent secret service protection and because of my faith in God. I tell you, Obama had it right. It was his faith in God that kept him saved. And while you and I don't have the luxury of having secret service protection, we've got something a little bit better. We've got some angelic protection. The old folks said it's all night and it's all day that the angels keep watching over me while you in the valley God gives you his protection but then God gives you his God's assurance let's just say God's assurance because not only did he have a rod he also had a staff a staff was a long rod that had a crook on the end the shepherd would use the, the staff to count his sheep he kept a copious record of his sheep and if one of them was missing he would leave the rest of the flock and go looking for that one and he wouldn't stop looking until he found him and sometimes the sheep would have fallen into a ditch and the good shepherd would take that staff with the hook in and hook that sheep under the forelegs and lift it out of the ditch ain't that good news that our good shepherd came looking for us he looked for you in the in the, in, the, in, in, in the crack house he looked for you in the drug house he looked for you at the nightclubs he looked for you at the board uh, table he looked for you when you were too mean to live and wasn't fit to die he looked for you when you didn't have enough sense to pray for yourself you've got that assurance that when we fall into the ditch he'll pick us up do I have a witness but wait in the valley you got another you got another resource and that is God's favor can church say God's favor you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Some scholars believe that now David shifts metaphors and is talking not so much about God as the good shepherd, but now he speaks of God as a gracious host who invites his guest to come to the dinner table and share fellowship in his presence. However, the Tim Keller who was a theologian and a sheep herder he interprets you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies through the lenses of a sheep following behind a shepherd sometimes the shepherds would lead the sheep up into the mountains in ledges on the mountains high up above the valley and on those ledges they were there were flat lands they called table lands where there was plenty of grass for the sheep to graze on so that the shepherd the sheep could graze in peace because the shepherd would lead them up to the table lands and he would stand there at the edge looking down at the wolves and the coyotes that wanted to get the sheep but he stood there with his rod and his staff and said I dare you to come bother my sheep do I have a witness in here however you interpret this as he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies whether you interpret it as God as a good shepherd or God as a gracious host here is the truth the truth is this that God will bless you while your enemies are watching him bless you and there isn't a thing they can do about it do I have a witness God will bless you and throw a blessing party for you and make your enemies come watch you because what God has for you it is for you no demon no devil no man, no woman, no boy, no girl in heaven or in earth can stop you from having what God wants you to have. In other words, he gives you his favor. Can the church have favor? I don't know about you, but I'd rather have favor than to have a pocket full of money. Because you can have a pocket full of money and no doors will open. 
But if you got favor, you can make one phone call and doors will fly open. Is there anybody besides me that wants God's favor? Somebody shout favor. 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 Hey. Wait. Well, he gives us some more resources while we're in the valley. And that's God's comfort. Let's just say God's comfort. He says, You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over now the metaphor definitely changes from speaking of God as the shepherd to now speaking of God as a gracious host you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies you anoint my head with oil my cup runs over in antiquity when you invited somebody to your home you were expected to show hospitality. As a matter of fact, if you didn't show hospitality, then you brought shame on your family and shame on the village. Do I have a witness? So the first thing the host would do is he would anoint the head of his guests with oil. He would anoint, pour oil on their heads and oil on their weary feet. It was a sign of hospitality. But not only would he pour oil on their heads, he was also to provide plenty of good wine. And sometimes the host would pour the wine into the cup and let the wine run over the rim. That's a sign of gracious hospitality. That's when the host is just showing off. Every now and then, God will show off in our lives. Has God ever shown off in your life? I mean, has God ever done more than you expected God to do? You asked God for one thing, and God didn't just give you that. He gave you that plus. He will do exceedingly, abundantly, above all you can ask or think. Sometimes God blesses me, so I have to say, God, you're just showing off now. You're showing off now. You're showing off now. Do I have a witness here? Oh, but wait a minute, wait a minute. While you were going through the valley, you got another resource. And that is you got God's backup plan. Let us just say God's backup plan. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Oh, surely, it could be interpreted, I am certain that goodness and mercy or surely could mean only which means nothing but your goodness and your mercy goodness and mercy are pictured as God's messengers that followed David throughout his life do I have a witness here he said they follow me in other words they got my back when you know God as your shepherd can I make an announcement? You've got some stalkers in your life. I said you've got some holy stalkers. They're called goodness and mercy. Surely goodness and mercy have been following me all the days of my life. That's the only reason I'm alive tonight. Is because surely goodness and mercy were following me. I've driven through a red light, got three blocks on the other side of the red light, looked into the rear view mirror and realized I could have had a wreck and killed myself. But the only reason it didn't happen is surely goodness and mercy were following me. You've been on a parking lot when some fool had made up his mind. He was going to hit you in your head and take your money. But the only reason it didn't happen is surely goodness and mercy it ain't because of how smart you are it ain't because of where you went to school it ain't because of how many degrees you have it's not because of who you knew downtown but surely hey goodness and mercy have been stalking me following me do i have a witness but you got one more one more one more resource and that is god's constant companionship I said God's constant companionship and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever the gracious host invites the guest not simply to spend the night but he invites the guest to stay with him for a lifetime I don't know about you
but one night with God would be enough for me one day with God would be enough for me but David says I will dwell in the house of the Lord in the presence of the Lord not just for the night but all the days of my life do I have a witness here he said lo I'll be with you even to the end of the world he'll be with you when the burdens are heavy he'll be with you when the trials are many he'll be with you in the good times and bad times why could David say that pastor is because his relationship with God was personal notice the personal pronouns throughout this psalm I my me and mine y'all read it the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me to lie down in green pastures. he leaves me beside the still water he restores my soul he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name said yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies you anoint my head with oil my cup runs over surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and i will dwell in the house of the lord forever child of god it's got to be personal yes friends the valley times will come yes my brothers and my sisters life will not always be a mountaintop experience but in this life you and i are going to have to face some valleys can i get a witness here but i'm here to tell you when you know the lord as your shepherd he'll never leave you in the valley how can you say that watson because i've had my share of being in the valley i've had many tears and sorrows I've had questions for tomorrow there have been times when I did not know right from wrong can I get a witness but in every situation God gave me the consolation that my trials come to make me strong can I get a witness so I thank God for my mountains thank God for my valleys I thank God for the storms he's brought me through if I never had a problem I would know that God could solve them I would know what faith in his word could do can I get a witness so through it all I said through it all through it all to trust in Jesus I've learned to trust in God through it all through it all I've learned how to lean and depend on him won't it take care of you say yeah say yeah say yeah say yeah What a word, what a word, what a word. We'll all have our valleys. But with God's help, realizing that we have a shepherd, we can make it through the valley. Oh, thank God for his holy word. Did not this preacher preach tonight? Thank you, Reverend Watson. Thank you, friend and brother. It's good to know 
that even in these valleys that somebody's in right now, we have the Lord with us. And this is an excellent, it is a powerful time to extend the invitation because somebody is trying to navigate your way through the valley without the Lord. And you need him to be with you. You need him. You need him to help you through your valley. Somebody ought to come to Jesus while you have time. There may be somebody here who needs to yield your life to Jesus Christ. Come on. There may be somebody here who may have fallen by the wayside and you need to come on back to the Lord. Walk out. Some blessings will not come to you until you come back to him. Walk out. There may be somebody here who says, Pastor, I am a child of God. I've been praying for God to guide me, to direct me to a good church. And the Lord has laid it upon your heart that your search is over. Come on. Walk out. Walk out. And as the choir leads us, you may be among those in the balcony. If so, come down either of these side stairwells or take the elevator down to this level. If you're on the floor level, there's an aisle that will bring you here. Some friend or loved one will gladly walk with you. Walk out. Come. While you have time. Don't put it on. Come. Make up your mind. What will he do? Won't he do it? Care. Even in your valley. Now here's the thing that gets me happy. Just knowing. Just knowing. Just knowing. She. In my life Come to Jesus Come to Jesus Why? Why you have time Oh yes And though you Though you may not May not have a friend He'll go with you All the way To the end Come Come to Jesus Come to Jesus While you have time Oh yeah Come to Jesus While you have time Time is 
running out. Come! Come to Jesus! Why? God bless you. Oh Lord, oh Lord. Tell somebody, I know Jesus. I know Jesus. And tell them, just knowing Jesus has paid off and continues to pay off. in my life and even though you even though you may not have a friend there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother and he'll go with you to the end oh Let the church say amen. Again, we want to thank Reverend Dr. Maurice Watson. <laughs> for dipping some fresh water out of that old well of the 23rd Psalm. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes. As we get ready to make our way from this holy place in preparation to make our way to our various homes and destinations, we want you to know that we'll be right back here on tomorrow evening. Amen. Dinner is served down in the fellowship hall starting at the six o'clock hour but it closes at the seven o'clock hour so that a bad the revival service can uh, kick off and we certainly want you to know that you can go downstairs and eat a delicious meal and come on back because some leave work and they don't have time to go home and get anything to eat you can get it downstairs and come on up here move on upstairs to the sanctuary and be blessed by another powerful word from the Lord from our evangelist on tomorrow night now if you are by chance numbered among those that came in after the offertory period had ended I know you're hurt I know you're hurt whomever you may be you hurt, amen, and you need, amen, to give your offering, your financial contribution, amen, to bless this man of God, amen. Our ushers are at the doors, amen, uh, with offering baskets, amen, to receive any late offertory contributions, and we certainly encourage you to give your offering. If you didn't give it earlier, Amen. Amen. Please give your offering as you exit. Amen. Have we not been blessed tonight? Amen. Amen. Now, guess what would happen if each one would bring one? 
if you would make it a point to bring somebody else with you tomorrow night. Oh, it should have been a lot more amens in there. You know somebody who needed to be here for this word tonight. If everybody would bring somebody else with you. Amen. If they could see the fire and the passion in you. They said, come on. Be like that Samaritan woman. Who met Jesus at the well. Go run it and tell other folk. Come on. And they left the town and went out there to where Jesus was. Amen. Come on. Tell somebody. Bring somebody else. Amen. Amen. As we get ready to go now, let me ask that we would all stand. A day of Prayer and fasting was set aside, praying that God would pour out his blessings upon this revival effort on this past Friday. Amen. And we want you to continue to pray, to lift this preacher to God in your prayers, and to pray that the Spirit of the Lord will fill this house with his powerful presence. We need it, and God knows we need it now. Amen. Father God, we thank you afresh for your presence in this place. Thank you, dear Father, for the powerful word that was brought to us. Dear Father, we thank you for the anointing that you poured out on this preacher that he could bless us with such a mighty word. Now, Lord, we're going to go back with a new perspective on our valleys. And Father, we pray now that the grace of you, our wonderful God, the love of our awesome Savior, Jesus Christ, the sweet communion of your powerful Holy Spirit shall rest, shall rule, and shall abide with each and every one of us now, henceforth, and yes, even forevermore. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. And we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And amen. 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 God bless you.